Uh, good afternoon to those who have joined us today for this webinar on GDPR. Um, I hope you can all can hear me. Um, the purpose of today's webinar is to discuss uh, the GDPR, the changes that that has made to the current data protection regime in the UK, and in particular how it affects HR and how you as an employer can comply. Um, I'm aware, having delivered a number of um, presentations on GDP, GDPR so far um, within our offices, uh, but there's also a large amount of interest in terms of um, how GDPR affects client data and things like that. Uh, so I will try and touch on that wherever possible, um, but you should uh, um, be aware that much of what we discussed today will apply to any sort of personal data. So it doesn't matter whether or not it's employees, clients, um, or other members of the public that you deal with. Um, firstly, a little bit about myself. My name's Guy Woodcock. I'm the head of legal support for EL Direct. Um, we as a company provide employment law and HR support to a number of companies across the UK, um, small and medium sized businesses, and obviously a large amount um, of uh, data protection issues fall within HR management as well, which is why we've been running these seminars and today's webinar. Um, this is a live webinar, um, and so if you do have any questions, then please feel free to use the chat function on YouTube, and I will endeavour to either respond to them in the course of giving a presentation or at the end. Um, we did have uh, over 200 people register for the webinar, um, so if there are too many questions then, then I may have to apologise and not be able to deal with them all, but I will do so as much as possible. So today we're going to talk about the GDPR in particular and what it is. Um, but the GDPR is only a new part of data protection, so we're going to talk about more generally about data protection in the UK to give everybody an oversight of that. Uh, we'll then move on to talking about the data protection principles under the data protection regulations, the key issues and the changes that have come in as part of the GDPR. Finally, to conclude, we'll talk through some practical steps to data protection compliance in HR and the sort of measures that you would need to be implementing to ensure compliance. So firstly, what is the GDPR? Well, I think it's useful to go back to the original source of the um, uh, regulations, which is European law and it's a new European directive. And this states that it's a regulation on the protection of natural persons with regard to the processing of personal data and on the free movement of such data. So we're talking about natural persons here, so we're not talking about limited companies, public bodies, other corporate organisations, etc. We're talking about living individuals. And this is because data protection law comes from the human right to privacy, which exists under the UN Convention of Human Rights, the European Convention of Human Rights, and the UK Human Rights Act. Uh, so this is where the data protection law comes from. And you'll see here that it's repealing Directive 9546ED. And so I'll just talk a little bit briefly now about how we've got to where we are today. So data protection law in the, um, started back in 1995 mainly with the Data Protection Directive 1995. That was a piece of EU legislation and, and that was brought into force in 1998 by the Data Protection Act in the UK. And that is what we've been working on under until now and will continue to do so until the 25th of May 2018. Several years ago it became apparent that the old Data Protection Directive and the Data Protection Act were not fit for purpose. And that's because of how technology has advanced in the last 20 years with the boom of the internet, cloud-based storage systems, social media, mobile telephones, apps, etc. And so a working party was set up to update the law. And this resulted in the General Data Protection Regulation 2016, which was published by the EU um, two years ago. And when we talk about the GDPR, that's what we're talking about in particular. Now all member states, and this includes the UK, were required to implement the GDPR by the 25th of May 2018. And that is what will happen 
in the UK under the Data Protection Act 2018. That's currently a bill finishing its progress through Parliament and it's fully anticipated that that will be in force on or before the 25th of May. A quick word about enforcement. So the Information Commissioner's Office has been in existence for some time now and is the UK body responsible for enforcing data protection law. And the ICO operates very much in the same way as HSC in relation to health and safety or HMRC in relation to tax and revenue. So firstly, it's there to provide guidance and advice to individuals and organisations about data protection, what the law is and to provide interpretation so that organisations know what they need to do and individuals know what their rights are. And if you haven't already been onto their website, I would recommend it because it's extremely comprehensive and provides a huge amount of data. So if you've got particular queries, that's a very good place to start. Um, in addition, it will be the body that would prosecute in the event of a breach of data protection. Um, so, like the HSE would do in relation to breaches of health and safety, or HMRC can do so in, in failures for PAYE or tax avoidance, the Information as Commissioner's Office can do so in relation to data protection, and that will continue from the 25th of May. And when we talk about accountability, which is a new part of the GDPR, we will in particular uh, look at the Information Commissioner's Office broadened um, uh, powers in relation to that. As we've just seen, uh, data protection law in the UK stems from European law and therefore it's very important um, uh, that we know what Brexit is going to mean for data protection. Um, now, my personal view is that it will mean not very much and that's for two reasons. First of all, all EU law is going to be transposed uh, during the transition uh, to Brexit through the Great Repeal Bill, so there'll be no initial change in the law. All European law will become UK law. It will then be upon the government to decide which, if any, European regulations it wants to change, get rid of, update, etc. Uh, now there's thousands and thousands of these regulations, and obviously there'll be certain ones which are a priority, and I don't initially anticipate that data protection will be. Secondly, after Brexit, any UK company trading in the EU will need to be subject to equivalent data protection systems as EU companies are. And given the amount that the UK trades and it's anticipated will continue to trade with the EU, it's unlikely that UK will change the law, because that would mean that we would then have two separate regimes and that would be confusing for organisations. So my view is that Brexit is not going to affect the GDPR and what it means the 25th of May at any point in the near future. It could well be another 20 years before we see any further updates in data protection law. So, finally, before I get into the nitty gritty, is the GDPR the end of the world as we know it? Well, my view is that no, it's not. There's been quite a lot of hype, um, some might see, say scaremongering, a lot of uh, references to the amount of fines that can be charged by the ICO and things like that. But the GDPR is an update to existing law, making it more appropriate for today's world. It's not bringing in wholesale changes in, in the law or policies and procedures, and therefore it shouldn't be out of the way of any company to comply with the GDPR. However, in order to be able to comply, it's in that you're aware of the changes and in particular your general data protection obligations and that's the idea of today's webinar is to give you that information so that you know what your responsibilities are and how you can go around complying with those responsibilities. So in order to talk about data protection first of all we need to know what sort of data we're talking about because the GDPR doesn't cover all data. Now, as we saw in that initial definition from the regulation, we're talking about the processing of personal data. And that's defined as being any information relating to an identified or identifiable living individual. So that definition begs two questions. Firstly, does the data relate to an individual? 
So if the data doesn't relate to an individual, it cannot be personal data and therefore would not be covered by the GDPR. Um, so obviously, information relating to a corporate company, a limited company, such as its name, its bank account details, its finances, will not of their own account be personal data, so wouldn't be covered by the GDPR. So it does need to relate to an individual. Now that could be all sorts of information. It could be someone's favourite colour, favourite football club, TV show and so on. Um, but then there is a second question we have to ask. Although we may have data which relates to an individual, can we actually identify a living person from that information? And if the answer is no, then again it won't be personal data. So for example, we may know a list of people's favourite colours, but that's all we know about them. We don't know their name, their address or anything like that, so we know personal information about them, but we would be unable to identify that person from that information. So that list of favourite colours wouldn't be personal data. And what that means is that we can also separate personal data out into different sections and do different things with it. And if we can't identify an individual from it, then we can be confident that it won't be deemed to be personal data. And what this means is that personal data in particular can be used in a statistical format or an anonymous format to do certain things. Many of you will hopefully be aware that larger companies over the past couple of months have been reporting on the gender pay gap within their company. Now that necessarily involves reporting on someone's salary. Now that salary information is personal data because it relates to an individual. But because it's put into purely statistical format, we can't identify individual from that information and therefore we can publish it for the whole of the UK to see without being in breach of any data protection laws. However, if, a question, if the answer to both those questions is yes, yes it relates to an individual and yes we can identify a living person from it, then it is personal data and the GDPR does apply. Just to give some examples from an HR point of view, things that would amount to personal data, well obviously things like names, addresses, telephone numbers will be personal data. Email addresses often will be, including work email addresses if it includes the person's name or an element of their name, first name and initial, initial and last name, possibly even first name by itself because potentially we can identify that person from that information. And then information within the organisation, which might not mean much to people outside it, will still often be personal information. So someone's job title, how much someone gets paid, because most, a lot of people in the payroll department of a company may be able to identify a person solely from their salary. The same in relation to things like working hours and absence and leave records. A manager will be able to identify an individual just by having a look at their leave records to say that someone was off sick last Wednesday. They will often know exactly which individual that was, even though the name is not available to them on the data that's presented to them. And then obviously a lot of information that you will collect during the employment relationship will be personal data and that includes key information such as disciplinary records, appraisal and performance information and training records as well, certificate, certificates of attendance etc etc. This can all be personal data within the employment relationship. In addition to the um, uh, ordinary categories of data, we have what are now called special categories of personal data. And this is categories of information which is more strictly regulated. Now under the existing law of the Data Protection Act 1998, this was called sensitive personal information. So we've had a slight change in terminology. But the information is very much the same as what we uh, were dealing with already. Uh, one particular aspect has been taken out which is criminal records information and we will discuss that um, specifically a little later on. But special categories of uh, personal data include racial or ethnic origins, trade union membership, uh, data concerning health, uh, information relating to an individual's sex life or their sexual orientation, 
and it also includes uh, data regarding a person's political opinions, such as political party membership or activism that they engage in, and also religious or philosophical beliefs. So obviously an individual's religion, but also things do they believe in a particular philosophical way of life. Um, now those familiar with employment law and in particular the Equality Act will recognise that most of these are things that people can be discriminated against unlawfully under the um, Equality Act 2010 or in relation to trade union membership under the Trade Union uh, uh, Labour and uh, Relationships Act. Um, and that's because this information is sensitive and people shouldn't be treated less favourably. And I think that's why this sort of information is more strictly protected under data protection law as well. So we need to understand that if we're handling this sort of information as an employer, as an HR manager, we need to be more careful about what we do in this compared to what we do with someone's timesheets. Um, so having looked at what is personal data, I think it's useful just to discuss briefly what isn't personal data. So firstly, if an informa information which an individual, individual cannot be identified from won't be personal data. So if it's been properly anonymised, so the individual's names and other identifying features have been removed, then it won't be personal data. If it's pre presented in purely statistical form, in format, so that means that someone's personal data has been mixed in with other people's to present something in a statistical format, then it's not likely to be personal data. Which is why this allows companies to report on things like the gender pay gap, equality and diversity in the workplace, average numbers of days off in a year across the workforce and things like that. And also certain information in isolation. So again, as we've seen, if we can't identify an individual from that information, then it won't be personal data. Um, corporate information will not be personal data because it doesn't relate to a natural person. It relates to a limited company or a public body, a limited liability partnership, an incorporated charity and things like that. So that will include things like the organisation name. EL Direct Limited identifies a company, but it doesn't ident identify an individual. The bank details of that organisation will not be personal data. Now, obviously, you always need to be careful with financial information, but if you were to lose a file containing all your suppliers' bank account details, you wouldn't be prosecuted by the ICO because it wouldn't be personal data. And things like financial information, accounts, etc., relating to uh, corporations, again, will not be personal data. Um, and then intellectual property will generally not be personal data because we're talking about things like inventions, trade secrets, trademarks, design marks and copyrighted information. So we're talking about non-natural things, we're talking about written documents and physical uh, products and things like that. So again, as a general rule, it won't in itself be personal data. Now it's important to say a little bit about intellectual property and also corporate information. You often, as an employer as, or as an employee, as a company, enter into some sort of contract in relation to confidentiality because you'll have access to what people deem to be confidential information such as financial information, trade secrets, inventions, etc. Now it's important obviously that you comply with your contractual obligations and not disclose that information to people that you shouldn't do. As an employee, not to take a company's confidential information after you leave them and give them to your new employer or use it to set up your own business. But if you do that again, you won't be in breach of a GDPR and it's not something that the ICO would be concerned with. Instead, it would be the other company, the party injured by your breach of that confidentiality agreement or non-disclosure agreement who would be taking civil legal action against you and suing you for damages or looking to obtain an injunction against you using that data. So again, there may well be legal obligations, but it won't be under the GDPR. And it's important to know the distinction between the two because that will govern how you would deal with that information. So having talked about what personal data is, we now need to talk about the parties who are involved in data processing and in particular as an employer. Now, there's two key types of organisation or parties defined within the GDPR. And the first is known as a data controller. And a 
the data control there is someone, according to the ICO, who determines the purposes and means of processing personal data. Now employers determine the purpose for which they process employee personal data and generally it's in relation to managing the employment relationship and they also determine the means of how that information is going to be stored, how it's going to be processed, what type of payroll system they're going to use, what sort of HR um, personnel file system they're going to use etc. So employers are data controllers under the GDPR in relation to the personal data they hold about their employees. Uh, now, many organisations who are employers will also be data controllers in relation to other personal data. So if you deal with individuals who are customers or members of the public are affected by the work that you do and provide you with information, then you will also be a data controller in relation to that information. And so it's important that you look at all aspects of personal data that you hold and the way in which you deal with it will be slightly different depending on whether someone's an employee or a client. Um, finally, um, the second category is data processors. And a data processor is defined by the ICO as someone who is responsible for processing data on behalf of a controller. So if there's always going to be a controller involved, there may not be a processor involved. So the third party processors that are likely to be involved in an employment relationship include payroll companies. So many Employers will provide payroll information, names, national insurance numbers, etc. to a payroll company to process payroll. So that payroll company is processing that personal data on behalf of the company upon their instruction and therefore is a data processor. HR consultancies like ourselves, we are data processors because we receive personal data from an employer about their employees in order that we can provide our service, in order that we can provide advice and employee management services, etc. So we are a data processor. And pension providers as well will also collect personal data through an employer as part of the auto-enrolment process and therefore a data processor in relation to that. So now that we've identified those parties, it's important to talk about what the relationship is between those two parties. So, the data controller is the main party and they have the main obligations because they're determining what sort of personal data is collected and how it's going to be processed and they'll be choosing which data processes they're going to be using. However, data processes can be held liable for data protection breaches. Uh, so therefore, if there is some sort of information security breach, they lose personal data, they send it to the wrong person, they sell it on to someone without permission, then they could be held liable for that and the ICO could prosecute them for it. However, a data controller can also be liable um, for a breach by a data processor that's working on their behalf. And often that will be the case if it's considered that that data controller hasn't done suitable due diligence on a data processor. So if you just hand your personal data about your employees or your clients over to some third party without doing some sort of checks on what sort of organisation they are, what measures they have in place, uh, what their reputation is, then you may well be held liable for any subsequent breach by them. And that's why it's important to do some due diligence. Have they got an information security policy in place if they're going to be holding large amounts of your personal data in a software system? Do they get their employees to enter into confidentiality agreements? What sort of uh, physical security measures do they have in place if they're holding data in hard copy? Our office is locked, our filing cabinets locked, etc. It's useful to obtain this sort of information. And I'm sure, as we've seen, that many companies out there who contract larger clients and deal with personal data may well have received data protection questionnaires or seen it form part of pre-qualification questionnaires and tenders going forward. And so it's also important for your own purposes of being able to obtain new contracts and keep your clients satisfied that you've got these sort of measures in place as well, because you will often be a data processor as well if you're handling client data. Um, We'll talk briefly now just a little bit about individual responsibilities, but if you do have any questions in relation, relation to what is personal data and the parties involved, now may be a good time to put that question up on the chat and I'll try and answer it before we progress. Um, 
So yes, we'll just quickly talk about levels of responsibility within an organisation. So like many legal obligations, ultimate liability lies with the organisation itself. So if you are a limited company, it lies with a limited company. If you're a partnership, it lies with the partners. If you're a sole trader, it li lies with you as a sole trader. You have ultimate responsibility. And if there was a breach by your organisation, no matter where it occurred within the organisation, it would be you that would be responsible and you who the ICO would prosecute. Within your organisation, you'll then have individual liability, but that will be to the organisation itself and wouldn't be held necessarily liable by the ICO. So obviously, directors and senior management have internal responsibility for implementation of data protection measures. So it will be the directors and the senior managers, the person given responsibility for data protection to implement data protection policies, information security procedures, and make sure that these are being adhered to. And if there's a failure at that level, then it would be those people who would be held accountable for it. But obviously, like many things, in the same way as health and safety, in the same way as equality law, individual employees have responsibility as well. So if you've implemented a certain policy or procedure which requires employees to do X, Y or Z in relation to personal data, then it's their obligation as an employee to comply with that and if there's again a failure on their part then you would have a right to take disciplinary action against them. So if you say to an employee who has a company laptop that they're not to leave it in their car overnight and they do so when it's stolen from the car then you could help, help hold them liable for a breach of that particular policy. So now we've discussed the, uh, what personal data is and the parties involved, we'll now start talking about the data protection principles. And these are set out within the GDPR and there are also data protections within the Data Protection Act 1998 that have just been updated under the GDPR. So I'll just brief, briefly describe these and then we'll talk about them in a lot more detail as we go forward. So, we have seven principles, and the first one is lawfulness, fairness, and transparency. Now, lawfulness has always been a key principle. Organisations have to have a lawful reason to process personal data, and we'll look in a bit more detail about the sort of ones that will apply in the employment relationship. Now, there's been an increased focus under the GDPR on fairness and transparency. So we're not just talking about complying with a letter of the law, we're also talking about the spirit of the law. We're talking about protecting people's privacy and being fair in handling their personal data. And we're also talking about being transparent with it, being open about what we're doing with their personal data. Now, I don't necessarily think this is of huge importance to employers, but everybody will have seen in the news recently, including yesterday with Mark Zuckerberg being in front of Congress in the US, that there's a lot of questions being asked about the fairness and the transparency of how organisations like Facebook use personal data and who they're giving that information to, these companies like Cambridge Analytica. Um, and that's, going to, that's a large issue here, and those larger organisations uh, those organisations, which uh, social media companies who run apps which have got millions of individual subscribers and um, that collect lots of their personal data, so their fit, fitness apps, etc., uh, they're going to be under a huge amount of scrutiny in relation to this idea of fairness and transparency. However, again, it's still important that employers are fair with how they deal with employee information and they're transparent about it, and we'll talk about how that can be done towards the end of the seminar. The second one is purpose limitation, and that means that we're limiting the purpose for which personal data is used, and that should be limited to the purpose that we collected it for and told the individuals that we were going to use it for. So what that means is that if we tell an employee that we are going to collect and use their personal data for staff administration purposes, it doesn't mean that then we can use it for marketing purposes if that's what we wanted to do, we would have to back and ask the employee is that okay so we're limited to the purposes that the individual has been told about or could reasonably envisage. Now what that doesn't mean is that you have to always go back and ask for further consent if it's within the same purpose. So for example if you've collected information from an individual to give to your payroll company so that they can process payroll 
it's my view that you wouldn't then need to go back and say, can we also provide this information to a pension provider? Because it should be reasonably envisioned that that would be a possibility when that person needs to be registered on the pension scheme. Um, data minimisation. So that means keeping data that we hold on file to a minimum and collecting it. We shouldn't be collecting personal data which we don't need for the purposes that we've said we're going to collect it. So, in relation to the employment relationship, there will be lots of personal data that we'll need. We'll need contact information, bank details, national insurance number, etc. But we won't necessarily need information about which political party an individual supports and things like that because it's not relevant. So we should keep that data to a minimum and be able to justify why we are collecting and storing it. Personal data needs to be accurate. Um, so this means that the data that you hold on file should be up to date and accurate and you should take reasonable steps to ensure its accuracy. Because if personal data isn't accurate, then potentially then issues will arise. If you don't hold an accurate address on file, then you might be sending personal data to the wrong place and it could fall into the wrong hands. Um, but again, there's only so much you can do in relation to that. We'll talk a little bit about the boundaries of that as we go through. Uh, the fifth principle is storage limitation. And by storage limitation, what we mean is that we should only store data for as long as we need to and not beyond that point. So we shouldn't be storing data indefinitely unless there's a clear reason to. Now, this can cause huge amounts of confusion and issue in particular for employers because there's all sorts of regulations um, which say how long you need to keep certain data for. And I'll touch upon a couple of those um, as, as we talk through that. Just to give one example, all employers need to collect from every employee proof of that individual's right to work in the UK. And often that will mean taking a copy of their passport or their work permit or their birth certificate or something similar and keeping that on file. And what the relevant immigration legislation says is that employers must keep that information on file for a period of up to two, at least two years after employment ends. So there's a clear legal reason to keep hold of that data for so long. Beyond that two years, there's no longer a need to keep it, so generally then that data should then be deleted. And we'll talk a bit about data deletion as we go through as well. Uh, number six is integrity and confidentiality. And this is really relating to information security. So once we've collected personal data and hold it, we are under an obligation to maintain the integrity, the security of that information and to keep it confidential, to not disclose that information to other people that don't need to know about it. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about the general principles of information security and confidentiality and then go on to talk about ways in which that can be done, certain practical examples. And then finally we've got uh, the principle of accountability. Now this is a brand new principle that's coming under the GDPR and what this relates to is organisations demonstrating how they are accountable for data protection. Uh, so it's no longer possible for employers just to assume that they will fly under the radar and that they'll never come under scrutiny and even if they do there's not much that can be done about it as long as they haven't lost any personal data. The ICO now has the power to hold organisations accountable for their data protection procedures even if there hasn't been a breach. And that means that they potentially will be carrying out audits in the same way as the HSE do in terms of going onto sites or going uh, into organisations and carrying out audits about their data protection regime. Now, I don't want everyone to worry that within the next few months after May 25th, the ICO are going to be knocking on the door and saying we want to look at your data protection. From a practical point of view, the ICO is quite a small government department. It's a lot smaller than the HSC. It's much smaller than HMRC. And HMRC, on general, audit every company once every 10 years or so. So my view is that in terms of the accountability um, requirements, the ICO will very much be focusing on large-scale data processes. They'll be focusing on Facebook, Cambridge Analytica, companies that deal with uh, large amounts of health information and things like that.
Uh, so we'll now start talking a little bit now about uh, the data protection principles in a bit more detail. So firstly, lawful reasons to process personal data. Now, up until now, uh, most organisations in any sort of capacity, be it as employers, as providing a service to individuals, have tended to rely on consent as, to, as their excuse or reason for hold out, holding and processing personal data. Now, consent is still something that is permissible under the GDPR. The law has changed slightly, and in the employment relationship, I don't think it's no longer necessary or appropriate to be focusing uh, or using consent as your lawful reason for processing personal data. So what we need to identify is other lawful reasons to process personal data. And the first one is to comply with a contractual obligation. When you employ someone, you are entering into a contractual relationship with that person under which they will carry out work and in return you will pay them for that work. That's a contractual relationship. And therefore it may be necessary for you to collect and use personal data in order to comply with that contractual obligation. And I think most people would agree that, um, you know, despite uh, people's protestations about job satisfaction and being in a vocation, the prime per reason every employee turns up for work on a Monday morning or wherever it will be, will be because they're going to get paid at the end of the week or month in order to pay the bills and do whatever they want to be able, need to do with that money. So that means that an employer is under a contractual duty to make payment of wages to an employee. And in order to do that, they will need certain personal information. Uh, they will need bank details in order to be able to perform a bank transfer. And I've been asked a question before, can an employee insist that they're being paid in cash because they don't want to give over the bank details? Well, my view is that no, they can't insist on that if it's your policy to make payment to all your employees by bank transfer. Um, it's not necessary for you to have a separate reason. You don't need their consent to have the bank details. If they don't want to give you the bank details, you would be within your rights to say, well, in that case, we can't employ you because we won't be able to pay you. Now, you'll also need other information. So you'll need their national insurance number to register them on your payroll software to process the payment and be able to report back to HMRC. Uh, and you'll generally need their address as well, especially under the real-time information, in order that HMRC can check that um, they've got the correct employee to assign the tax to, etc, etc. Um, just talking a little bit outside um, the employment relationship, many companies, part of their service will be providing goods to a client. And in order to deliver those goods, they will need the name of the individual and address and maybe a telephone number in order to be able to contact them in relation to that delivery. So that would be a contractual reason to hold their personal data and use their personal data for those circumstances. So the first thing you'll often say to employees is that we need your personal data to comply with our contractual obligations. A second lawful reason to process personal data is to comply with a legal obligation. And I'm sure everybody is aware that all employers are subject to a whole range of employment legislation that they have to comply with, health and safety legislation, legislation relating to equality and diversity, legislation relating to working time and annual leave, uh, legislation relating to the national minimum wage, etc. And often complying with these legal obligations again will mean that you will need to collect and use personal data relating to your individuals. So to give a couple of examples, as I mentioned briefly before, all employers are undue, under a duty to obtain proof of right to work in the UK and to keep a copy of that on file. And therefore, that means taking a copy of someone's passport, birth certificate, work permit, etc., all of which contain personal data. And because there's a legal obligation, that gives you the right to collect, store and use that personal data. And if an employee refuses to give you a copy of their passport or birth certificate or some proof of right to work in the UK, again, then you can refuse employment to that individual. Or if their work permit were to expire and they don't give you a new one to terminate their employment at that stage or suspend it. 
uh, and health and safety obligations particularly important to organisations working within high risk industries, manufacturing, construction, etc, etc. And now for most employees you'll want to take emergency contact details which means the personal information of a relative or a friend of an employee in order that you can contact them in the event of the emergency and make them aware of that fact. Um, and relevant medical information, some employees will be subject to health surveillance if they're exposed to noise or dust in the course of their employment. Uh, individuals who drive heavy goods vehicles have to undergo medical checks and therefore you need to collect and store health in relation to it to comply with your health and safety obligations and again therefore you've got a legal obligation to collect and make use of that personal data irrespective of whether or not the individual is happy to consent to that. And I think the third key one uh, in the employment relationship is for the establishment and defence of legal claims. Now again, uh, all employees are aware that they're at risk of an employee bringing a claim against them for all sorts of reasons, be that uh, deduction from wages, uh, holiday pay, unfair dismissal, uh, discrimination. Uh, therefore, you will need information often that will enable you to defend those legal claims. Um, and to uh, give some examples, uh, if an individual brings a claim for unfair dismissal against your company because you dismissed them for misconduct, you will need to have their disciplinary records on file to be able to properly defend that claim. Because if you don't have copies of the warning letters that you issued them, the investigation notes, the evidence of a misconduct that they were guilty of, you can't properly defend that claim in a tribunal. So that would be a reason to maintain a record of that information and to keep hold of it even beyond when the employment relationship ends. <coughs> um, an individual who's got a serious health complaint could make a claim of disability discrimination against a company. And therefore you will often need health records on that individual on file in order to be able to explain the decision that you took. An occupational health report or doctor's report that showed that that individual was clearly unable to carry out the job or discussions about their health within the employment relationship where you discuss potential adjustments that you can make. Again, you can't defend that claim properly without having access to that information. Um, payroll records to defend a claim in relation to wages. Um, again, so you will hold records about the payment that you've made to individuals in relation to that person uh, and they may then complain that they weren't paid properly, you will need evidence of what you have or haven't paid them in order to be able to defend that claim. So again, that is um, another right to um, um, uh, hold personal data and use that in that case. Um, so uh, just before we progress, um, I've had a, a question in relation to holding the uh, information on, on, a, on a wife or a partner or some other relative, which I presume is in relation to the emergency contact. Um, now, you would then be relying on the, the individual giving you that personal information. Now, they may then, you know, have asked their wife or relationship if they're happy to act as an emergency contact. Now, I don't think this is an absolute right. I think that if an individual refuses to give you emergency contact details, it may still be possible to employ them. But I think that you could still point to the fact that under the, your health and safety obligations that would include being able to make relevant people aware of any accident on site and especially if someone works in a high risk industry or who goes out working alone if they're in a sa remote sales based role and things like that. If they refuse to give you the, the details of an emergency contact then that might then compromise their right or the position in which they can employ you. Uh, so I wouldn't say that you could necessarily refuse employment if they refuse to give you that information, but it would certainly be an assessment that you would need to make at that stage if someone refused to give you that information. Um, so what about consent? Well, consent still exists under the GDPR, as mentioned, and individuals can consent to their data being used in certain ways. The problem with consent is that it can be withdrawn at any time. 
and therefore it's better to seek to identify and rely on a different lawful reason to process personal data. Um, and I think in the majority of situations you will be able to identify a reason in relation to an employee. Consent is going to be applicable where it's desirable to do something with personal information but not absolutely necessary. And again, that might then you know, also be relevant in relation to emergency contact details. But also if you want to use employee information for marketing purposes, if you want to use images on your website or your Facebook page, and if you want to maintain a meet the team page, uh, then uh, I think then that you would need that individual's consent to do that. And if they were to turn around and say, I no longer consent to that, then unless you can identify a particular reason, a lawful re other lawful reason, then you would potentially have to stop using that information for marketing purposes. So consent is really useful where there's an element of desirability but not necessity. In the same way when you're dealing with your customers, you will need certain personal information to provide your services. Um, but you may not need certain information for marketing purposes, i.e. to profile customers such as gender or age and things like that. So you can ask an individual if they consent to giving you that information and you're using it for those purposes. But if they were then to contact you and say, I no longer want you to use my date of birth or gender um, um, for, for marketing, profiling or whatever it might be, then you would need to stop at that point because you don't need that information to provide your services. And that's why with a lot of things like social media, you can change your privacy settings. You can say, yes, you can do this, and the next day you can say, no, you can no longer do this. And that social media organisation should comply with those requests. Um, so we mentioned before special categories of personal data and the fact that these are given extra levels of protection. And therefore, we need to look at different lawful reasons for processing that personal data. Now, the first one is express consent. However, this can be revoked, but again, it may well be useful. Now, express consent is where you're collecting personal data at a certain time and being absolutely clear about what you're going to use that personal data. Now, an example of that might be where you've got an individual who's got some sort of health in, uh, uh, issue that's affecting their ability to carry out their job and you want to obtain an occupational health report or a medical report in order to make an assessment about their suitability for work. And so you can ex obtain their express consent at that stage and say, do you consent to us doing that? And they can make a decision as to whether or not they do or not. However, if they did give you consent to obtain a medical report, they could the very next day come back to you and say, I now revoke my consent and you would have to honour it. Another lawful reason for processing special categories of data is to comply with an employment law obligation, a specific employment law obligation. And so, for example, we've seen that certain uh, companies are under an obligation to report on the gender pay gap within their organisation and that means that they're actually going to be using personal data which relates to an individual's gender um, and therefore that's uh, sensitive personal information. Public bodies are under a duty to report on equality and diversity within the workplace uh, and therefore they need to report on things like someone's uh, race and national origins, gender, age, disability, etc. And therefore that gives them a specific lawful reason to collect and use that personal data. Now they need to be careful and therefore they need to be careful that generally when they're publishing that personal data it is an anonymous format, it is in statistical format when they're making that data public but it does mean that they can hold it privately in relation to an individual. I think this is going to be a particularly common reason for organisations collecting health information. So you can collect health information for occupational health reasons and for assessing the capacity of a worker. So at the recruitment point, certain roles will require you to carry out some sort of health assessment. People working on the railways, HGV drivers, people working in the armed forces, in the fire service, etc. and various other regulated industries. And so therefore, 
uh, for occupational health reasons, you will be able to collect health information at the point that they start work, be that through a doctor's assessment, some sort of medical questionnaire, etc. Um, and also to assess the capacity of a worker. So obviously if you've got an employee who's employed in a particular position who then has some sort of health issue which means that they've had an absence from work or which affects their ability to do the job safely, then you can collect health information to assess their capacity to do that job safely. And that would include things like fitness to work statements, so a note from their GP about what the health condition is and the adjustments that might need to be made. Return to work information, so collecting health information through a return to work meeting with individual and recording that on the form and placing that on their personal record. And again also obtaining medical reports and occupational reports from doctors to check that they are safe to return to work or what sort of adjustments need to be put in place. Again, you would then lawfully be able to collect and process that personal data. Talk a little bit now about criminal records information. Um, so, under the GDPR, criminal records information has been separated out from the other sensitive categories of information and given its own category and its own rules. And organisations have to be particularly careful when they're processing criminal records data. Now, under the Data Protection Act 2018, there will be two reasons, and uh, certainly or grounds for collecting and using criminal records data. So the first one also exists under the European law, which is where there's a legal obligation to do so. And the main one is where the role that an individual is doing is regulated according to the DBS, and therefore a DBS check needs to be done. Um, so that's people who are working di directly with children, or vulnerable adults, or working in certain industries such as finance or insurance. Um, so there's a legal obligation on that organisation to do a DBS check as part of that recruitment process and therefore they're entitled to do so under the GDPR. Now, a lot of employers, and that includes ourselves, carry out basic criminal records checks on their employees not because they're legally obliged to do so, but because they wish to do so for various reasons. Because those individuals are going to be handling things like financial information, credit card information, etc, etc. So it's desirable but not legally necessary to carry out a criminal records check. Well, the UK under the Data Protection Act 2018 has said that employers can continue to collect criminal records information to assess suitability for employment. So under the Data Protection Act 2018 it is going to be permissible to continue doing that. And I think it's important to point out that certain um, uh, Charities involved with rehabilitation of criminals or privacy have suggested that they don't think that that new um, right that the UK has given employers um, is lawful under privacy law, so it may well be challenged. But certainly at the moment, um, the indication is that you will be able to carry out basic criminal records checks even if you're not obliged to do so. Um, I would say a quick note. Uh, on keeping hold of criminal records checks which all organisations need to be aware of. The law is that you can only hold on to that information, so be it the DBS check or the criminal records check, the criminal records information held on that for as long as is necessary to make a recruitment decision and a maximum of six months. So as soon as you've made a decision about that individual's recruitment or ongoing employment, you should get rid of that criminal record information and not hold it on file in any format. <coughs> what you can hold on file is a record of the fact that you've done the check. And that would be normally maintaining some sort of spreadsheet or database which identifies the individual's name, the date that you did the check and the reference number from that check. Because that information won't identify any particular criminal record information in itself. However, if there was an issue in the future, a safeguarding issue, or where an individual has committed a crime, a fraud, or something like that in relation to their employment, you can use that reference number to go back to the DBS and say, can you confirm what was on that check at the time that we carried out? And it's a matter of record, so you would then be able to demonstrate what was in there. Either that it had come back clear, 
um, uh, or that there were certain uh, criminal records identified on there um, and that you would then need to look at the risk assessment process. Um, so yes, I've just had a, a question regarding storing just the certificate number of a DBS check. I think I've just answered that, but yes, just the certificate number is absolutely fine so that you've got a record of that check and then can go back at a later date if you need to do so. So we've talked about the lawful reasons that companies can collect and use personal data. So having collected and used that personal data, then it's important that companies maintain the security of their information. So that's why I'm going to talk about data, print, data protection principle number six now, integrity and confidentiality. So the GDPR, and uh, Data Protection Act 1998, the Data Protection Act 2018, none of these go into any detail about what sort of security measures companies should be implementing. All they say is that there's an obligation to keep that information secure and confidential. And therefore, it's up to individual organisations to decide how they're going to keep that information secure. And there's infinite ways of, of going about that and so I can only really talk about these quite generally but I'll try to do so uh, now and when we talk about accountability as well. <coughs> so the first way, an easiest way to ensure the confidentiality information is by keeping to a minimum the number of people who have access to that information. And often in the employment relationship, that means compartmentalising information and only making certain information available to certain people. To give an example, your payroll department or payroll processor only needs access to payroll information. So they'll need things like names and national insurance details, uh, bank accounts, uh, postal address, possibly an email address as well, so that they can process payroll. However, they don't need access to health information. All they need to know is how long someone's been off sick so they can calculate SSP, but they don't need to know why they're off sick um, or any other health records. So it's not necessary to give those people health information. And if you don't give them that information, that then stops them from being in a position to lose it or give it to the wrong person or misplace it. <coughs> Conversely, your employees who are in a supervisory position may not need payroll information because they're not involved in the payroll process at all. Their only involvement may be signing off a timesheet and passing it on to the payroll bureau. So they don't need things like bank details, etc. However, they may well need information relating to health so that they can administer first aid if someone's got a certain health condition um, or so that they can ensure that appropriate adjustments are in place. They need to know that someone's got some sort of back issue so that they shouldn't carrying out heavy, li heavy lifting and we're giving assistance with that. So that's the first thing, is limiting access to only those who need it. <coughs> and that means when you collect personal data, thinking about when you're going to store it and who's going to have access to it. Um, one particular key thing in the recruitment process is that often you will collect information on your application form about someone's um, race or national origins, gender, age, um, etc and diversity monitoring, we would always recommend that, that information is separated from the application form when it arrives, put into statistical format and not given to the person making the recruitment decision so that that can't affect their recruitment decision as well. And therefore, we're protecting that special category of personal information. <coughs> and in terms of actual security, so data will, will always be stored in one of two formats in hard copy format <coughs> or in electronic format and therefore we need to look at the measures that we implement in relation to that. So we should ensure that hard copy data is secure. So if certain information, health information, personnel files are kept in the filing cabinet then that filing cabinet should be left locked when no one's in the office or when the office is closed. If you have members of the public coming into your premises 
and you've got a back office where personal information is kept, then there should be some sort of means of preventing access to that back office to members of the public, so some sort of swipe card system or a key code that only employees have access to. So let's look at the relevant physical measures. And then electronic data now. Lots and lots of data is now stored in electronic format and more and more data has been transferred into electronic only format. But as we're all aware, data stored in electronic format is open to attack um, or theft or being misplaced and so therefore it's important to have appropriate measures in place. Now most basically that would start off with by insisting that all employees have an admin pa a password on their PC user account so that only that particular employee can access that user account and the personal data that's stored within that user account. So generally you shouldn't have multiple employees using the same user account because then it would be open to them to steal data and you wouldn't be able to identify where it is and therefore then that makes it easier for individuals to get away with it. Um, Lots of employees now use their own devices for work purposes. They'll access their work email through which they could access personal information. They might be able to access certain databases through their phone or iPad, tablet, personal laptop. And if that's going to happen, then you should have policies and procedures in place that require them to have security measures in place on that. Something like some sort of key code on the mobile phone or the iPad. Again, passwords on the laptops if they're going to allow their children to use their iPhones, which they also use for, use for work purpose, having some sort of way ensuring that that child can get onto the email system and start, you know, forwarding emails on and things like that. And having seen, you know, children using iPhones and things like that, I think that's entirely possible that that could happen. And that would then be a data protection breach, so you need to have measures in place to protect against that. And again, you may use third parties or involve third parties in the storage of your personal data in electronic format. So if you're using some sort of IT company that provides off-site backup, you need to make sure that they've got suitable um, security measures in place. Are they encrypting the data? Do they have firewalls in place? Um, do they have physical security measures in place at their server sites, such as CCTV or security guards, etc.? And things like that. So again, it's important to consider what sort of measures are implemented and are they suitable. Now, we don't have to have absolutely everything under seven levels of lock and key with all sorts of encryption. Not every laptop needs to have seven different passwords to get into it and a pin sentry and an access card and things like that. It depends on what sort of data we're talking about. Uh, and so you need to look at that and the measures should then be appropriate and proportionate. So for example, an individual's timesheet. So a timesheet may contain nothing but an individual's name or a payroll number and a detail of the hours that they've worked. Now that information isn't particularly important to anyone other than the individual themselves and the company in terms of recording and paying them correctly. So it's not going to be a particular issue if those timesheets are left on a desk for someone to pick up or in a pigeonhole or sent through the post or left in company vehicles or things like that because if they did happen to be misplaced or stolen there's not going to be much that can be done with that information. So the individual's right to privacy hasn't been compromised and the ICO aren't going to be particularly bothered about that. However, when we're talking about an individual's medical records which can contain extremely sensitive information about their health background and things like that, obviously then we need to have higher levels of security. So in no circumstances should an employee who has access to an individual's medical records just leave them lying about on their desk when they're not in the office. It should be returned to a locked filing cabinet. Or if it's accessed through a computer system, that screen should be shut down and the password and locked so that people can go on and access it without knowing that password. So obviously we need to look at the types of data and the measures that we need to implement should be proportionate. Because obviously it's not going to be feasible or viable to have everything under huge levels of security and never get anything done. So it's important to consider these sort of issues. So, um, 
two of the data protection principles are data accuracy and data minimisation, and I think they go hand in hand. So first of all, employers need to ensure that data is up to date and accurate, because if they don't, then payments might not be made properly in terms of wages, letters might go out to the wrong address, and so disciplinary issues can't be dealt with properly and things like that. Now, that's accepted that you can only go on the data that you've been given access to, and if an individual doesn't provide you up-to-date information, uh, you know, then there's not much you can do about it. But there are ways that you can encourage individuals to keep their data up to date. And the first way is by doing a periodic check. Say, for example, once a year, emailing all individuals and saying, this is the personal data that we hold on file, can you confirm that it's correct? Or asking people to reiterate, what is your current address? What is your current contact number? What is your current bank account details? Um, emergency contact details, etc. And giving them or encouraging them to check that and make sure that it is up to date because people often just forget to do these sort of things. So that's one way. The second way is by making it as easy as possible for individuals to update their data. And it's been said by the um, people involved in the EU in developing the GDPR that although it's not necessary, it's to be encouraged for organisations to hold personal data, give people digital access to it through some sort of employee or client customer portal. So when you sign up to some sort of service, you can then access that online and you can update your account settings so that you can change your, your address or your email address if you need to. You can update your payment details or your bank account details. So by giving people easier access to their information, being able to update it, that will assist you in keeping that data accurate and up to date. Um, <coughs> And then out of date data should be deleted. So you're not storing data that you no longer need because it's out of date. You generally won't need someone's old bank account details. Once they've given you new bank account details, so you should get rid of them. Um, you won't need old addresses and contact numbers and things like that because you'll be using their new addresses and contact numbers to contact them. So you should get rid of those from your database and things like that. Um, but you do need to be careful, uh, and employees can ask for data to be deleted, and the default position is that if they do ask for data to be deleted, it should be deleted, but there will be many reasons where you don't need to, and certainly shouldn't do. And we've already talked a little bit about um, the legal obligations to keep hold of data. You're under a legal obligation to keep hold of proof of right to work in the UK for two years after employment ends. You're under a legal obligation to keep hold of payroll information for the last three years. Um, and you may also want to keep hold of certain information in case you need to use it in a legal claim. Now, it's entirely feasible at the end of an employment, an employee will come and say to you, I want you to destroy my personnel file. Well, if that individual was dismissed for misconduct, then it's entirely foreseeable or reasonable to expect that they may bring a claim for unfair dismissal. So it's therefore within your rights to go back to that individual and say, in fact, we don't need to delete your personal data or your personnel file, in particular the disciplinary records, because we may need that to defend um, a um, claim for unfair dismissal or a claim for breach of contract. Now, the individual might say to you, oh, you don't need to worry about that, I'm not going to do that. They may even put that in writing. But that's not legally binding, so you don't need to accept it. And instead, I would be saying, an individual has got three months from the date of their employment has to bring a claim for unfair dismissal, so you should be keeping disciplinary information for at least six, three months. Now, most organisations will actually keep hold of it for six years after employment ends, because an individual's got six years to bring claims in the Call for breach of contract and things like that. So that's often the period of time recommended for general personnel files. But there are certain circumstances where you may need to keep data for much longer. Individuals working with health information relating to individuals working with children, I believe you need to keep hold of that for at least 15 years after employment ends. Individuals who are exposed to asbestos or lead or radiation in the course of their employment, you need to keep their health records on file for 40 years so it's important to be aware of what your legal obligations are before you delete information. Yeah. 
not in relation to an individual's right to ask for data to be deleted, they also have a right to access copies of personal data that you hold <coughs> um, on file about them. And these are called subjects access requests. So any individual whose um, personal data is held by another organisation can go to that organisation organization and say, I want you to supply me with copies of the personal data that you hold. So you could go to Facebook and ask them, or you could go to your dentist or your doctor, um, and also your employer, and make a subject access request. Um, so before I talk about these in general, there's a couple of changes which have come about under the GDPR. <coughs> Firstly, uh, you used to be able to charge £10 um, to comply with a subject access request and up to £50. Uh, many people who have been involved in requesting medical records will have been subject to a £50 charge from the individual's GP. Well, that can no longer be charged from the 25th of May. So subject access requests will have to be complied with without making a charge. The only exception to that is where an individual is making the, uh, you know, an unfounded number of subject access requests or uh, too high a frequency, in which case you can say, well, if you wanted to comply with that now, because if you've already made one within the last month, we're going to charge you for that. Yeah. The second change is that um, the uh, request must be complied with uh, within a month, when it was previously 40 days, so the time scale has been reduced. Now, in certain circumstances, you may not be able to comply within a month because it's a particularly complex request, in which case you need to go back to the individual within that one month period and explain that and explain why. Um, now, the only requirement from the employee's point of view is that the subject access request must be made in writing. It doesn't matter what form it's in, as long as it's in writing, it doesn't have to be on a particular form or use particular wording, as long as it's clear that they're asking for copies of personal data. What you may need to do or want to do is to take steps to identify that they are who they say they are. So if they're writing to you and asking you to send that information to an email address that you don't recognise or an address that you don't have on file, you may want to go back to them first and say, can you provide us with proof of identity? before you comply with the request. But if they can do so and they put it in writing, then the default position is that you will have to comply. Um, now, there are certain circumstances where you may not need to provide that information. Now, in the employment relationship, the only main reason that it's likely to apply is because it would compromise the privacy of another individual, such as another employee. Um, however, it may well be that you could redact that information or you can go to that individual and ask if they consent to that individual being um, be supplied with that information if they're referred to in a letter or an email or something like that. Other exceptions include generally where it's in the interest of national security or the public interest and they're going to be difficult to justify in most employment situations. <coughs> um, however, it's also important to realise that not all personal data that you hold as an organisation may need to be supplied under a subject access request depending on the format in which it's held. So if information is processed automatically, i.e. through some sort of software system such as payroll software, then yes it does need to be disclosed because that information should be readily accessible to you through that software situation. You can generally quite easily download some form of report from your payroll software. Um, or is it part of a relevant manual filing system? And that filing system can be in harder electronic format. And what that means, is it in some sort of organised filing system which allows you to identify and access that information quite readily? Um, now, in my experience, subject access requests in employment occur very rarely. In the six years that ER Direct has been trading and supporting uh, several hundred clients, it's only happened three times. And the third time actually came to my attention this morning. So it generally only happens, one, if an individual is disgruntled, and two, uh, if they're aware of their rights. And often one of the things that is asked for in those subject access requests is copies of all emails or correspondence relating to that individual. Now, some of those emails and correspondence um, may be um, held uh, on their personnel file. 
in which case it probably is in a filing system and it wouldn't need to be disclosed. Um, but if it's just held within an individual's employee inbox, um, which isn't organised in any particular way, you're not required to go through their entire email history to find every email that refers to that individual. Or if in the course of managing individual, managers have made diary entries in their diary or some sort of informal record and not put it on the personnel file, then you, that generally wouldn't be in a manual filing system uh, and therefore um, doesn't need to be disclosed. So you only need to disclose information through a subject access request if it's processed automatically or held in a relevant filing system. If it's not, you don't need to disclose it. Um, just had a, a question in relation to, I think, uh, subject access requests here, yeah, in relation to current employees or left employees. Uh, the right applies to both, because you will obviously hold file uh, information on file for current employees, but you will generally always hold file information on file for ex-employees as well. As you said, you've got to keep certain information for a certain period of time after they've left. Um, and so it doesn't matter whether or not they're a current or former employee, uh, employee they still have a right to make a subject access request. <coughs> so I'm now going to move on to uh, accountability. As I identified earlier in the presentation, Accountability is a new data protection principle under the GDPR. So this is something entirely new. Um, and it's defined as being the ability to demonstrate comprehensive and proportionate measures have been implemented to comply with the GDPR requirements. Um, so what this means is that when you're talking about accountability, you can't or certain aspects of GDPR and GDPR compliance, it's got to cover everything, but your demonstration of accountability needs to be proportionate, or only needs to be proportionate. So the requirements implemented on a huge multinational organisation that have got large amounts of resources and are processing huge amounts of personal data are going to be very different to a small private employer. So proportionality is an important um, um, thing to, to consider. Um, so not everybody is held to the same standard. And when we talk about accountability, three different ways of demonstrating accountability have been identified. Um, these are technical and organisational measures. Um, so what actual steps are organisations taking, both on a technical level and on an organisational level, to comply with GDPR and data protection. And then records of data processing, so maintaining records of the data that you process and how you do it, will help you demonstrate accountability because it will show that you've thought about your processes and that you're doing things in a certain defined way. Um, and thirdly, um, showing data protection by design. Now this is quite a vague or nebulous concept, but what I think this means is that you're building data protection into your company's procedures. So it's not a separate issue, it's not an afterthought, it's actually something that you're thinking about in all aspects of your operation where personal data is involved. So in relation to your employment op processes, in relation to dealing with clients where you're dealing with their personal data, data protection is built into those processes. So, I'm going to talk now a little bit about these different ways and that will allow us an opportunity to talk about different ways in which you can practically comply with your data protection obligations. So firstly, technical and organisational measures. That means implementing measures and procedures and the best way to be able to demonstrate those is by having policies and procedures that then actually reflect those in writing so that you can supply them to a third party, so that you can show them to the ICO so that you can show them to uh, potential clients or accreditation bodies if they're asking about your data protection regimes. 
So the first one that I think all organisations should implement, irrespective of whether or not they employ people or whether or not they deal with client data, is a data protection policy. So this is the policy of our organisation towards data protection. And this is demonstrating that as an organisation, the organisation is aware of their responsibilities and that it's their intention to comply with those things. And that policy then may go on to a bit of general information about how that will be done. For example, employees will be required to comply with the company's information security procedure, which we'll talk about um, a little bit further down. Um, <coughs> that the company will produce data protection privacy notices uh, in relation to the data that it collects and pro uh, processes and things like that. Uh, and as we talk about accountability and the way in which companies can comply, I'm going to talk a lot about data protection privacy notices because in my view these are a key document and they're also a key document in the eyes of the ICO. Um, so we'll talk about a little bit about that in more detail um, further on. Uh, having placed an information security procedure, so a documented information security procedure, and by having that you will have thought about the measure, information security measures you're going to implement. So. If you require all employees to sign in using a swipe card or some sort of key code and to not leave that door on the latch, then that would go in your information security procedure and that would be an organisational measure that you're implementing. If employees who have access to certain sensitive data are required to enter into some sort of confidentiality agreement, then that would be covered off in your information security procedure. Just the same, all employees who are work in an HR or payroll role or management role will sign an HR confidentiality agreement so that they're contractually signed up to agree with those particular responsibilities. If individuals are bringing their own devices to work and using them in the course of their employment, your information security procedure should contain a section on bringing your own devices saying that you must have a, some sort of uh, access uh, protection to your um, smartphone or to your iPad, the company laptops or work laptops or personal laptops with work information on must be stored in a secure place, not left in vehicles overnight. Again, having passwords on and things like that. So you're documenting the technical and organisational security measures that you are taking as an organisation. Um, and then I think then finally training as well. So people involved in data protection organization should have some sort of training. Now that would include, you know, watching today's seminar or um, carrying out toolbox talks within your organization when you issue in your data protection policy or your information security policy and keeping a record of that. In the same way that you can demonstrate compliance with health and safety law by training up employees to do their job safely, you can demonstrate accountability and compliance with data protection law by having training in place in relation to data protection obligations. So employees being aware of what their individual responsibilities are, that they're not to send third part data to third parties without consent or authorization from a senior member of staff, etc. etc. Um, so maintaining records of personal data, um, so firstly um, having managed personal records, so that means putting um, personal information into an organised filing system, so not just having it in a big pile sat on someone's desk or at the bottom of the drawer. You should have personnel files which are in alphabetical order or organised by department, be that in the filing cabinet or someone's computer, so that you know that when you need to access personal information you'll know where it is, so you're processing it in the correct way and keeping it secure. Um, having specific data protection privacy notices and getting those signed off when you collect that information. That's particularly important when you're collecting information such as health information or quality and diversity information. You know, actually stating what sort of data you're collecting and why, so therefore you're maintaining a record of the sort of data processing you're carrying out and you've got the individual's signature on there to show that they've actually agreed to that. So at the bottom of your new starter forms, at the bottom of your medical questionnaires, that's a record of your data processing at the collection stage. Um, and auditing. 
I think auditing is something that's going to become more important under the GDPR in order to demonstrate compliance. Because it's all well and good having in place a data protection policy and an information security procedure, data protection statements, getting employees to enter into confidentiality agreements and non-disclosure agreements. But that's no good if you don't actually enforce those policies and procedures. So therefore, if your information security procedure says that filing cabinets should be locked at certain times, and you do an audit and they're not, then that's a breach. And that needs to be taken to ensure that that process has been complied with. Because otherwise someone who's not authorised to could go and access someone's personal information. And then that can cause all sorts of issues. If the ICU happen to be doing an audit of your premises and those sort of things are available, if individuals haven't got passwords on their computer, then they may not say that you're enforcing your data protection procedures. So auditing will be important. Um, Auditing will also be important to check for in relation to data minimization and purpose limitation. Are you actually using the personal data for the purposes that you said you were going to? If you've only said that you're going to use personal data for staff administration purposes, but then you've actually used it for marketing, that becomes apparent through the auditing process because you haven't got a consent to the marketing form. And again, then um, that's somewhere where action needs to be taken. So you re maintain a record of how you're processing personal data and things like that. Um, and also then your auditing will look at whether or not you uh, need to keep that information any longer. Looking at ex-employee personnel files, where we've still got a copy of their passport on file, but they left more than two years ago, so we can get rid of it. Or we've still got all their disciplinary letters on file that they left more than six years ago so they can no longer bring a breach of contract to claim against us. So we should be getting rid of that because we no longer have a lawful need to keep hold of it. And an audit process should help you uh, manage that. Um, and uh, we will make available to people um, who have registered for the seminar a, su um, a suggested list of audit questions that you can use as part of a data protection audit. Um, and then data protection by design. Um, so this is building data protection into your operational procedures. Uh, so that's thinking about how you're going to protect personal data in relation to what you do day to day. And again, I think by producing a data protection statement, um, before you collect personal data, you'll be doing that because by producing a, per, uh, a data protection statement, you'll be thinking about the reasons why you're collecting personal data, what you're going to do with it, how long you're going to keep hold of it, what are an individual's rights in respect to that personal data. So by producing that, you're building those data protection requirements into your operational processes because you're thinking about how you're going to deal with health records, and what you're going to do with them, how you're going to deal with payroll information and personnel files and things like that. Um, and I think it's also important to have a data retention policy providing for, providing for deletion after a certain period by automated or reviewed means. So by actually thinking about how long you need to keep personal data for, building that into your audit process, that will mean that you're designing data protection into your operational procedures. So as long as, as well as auditing health and safety and accident statistics, we're auditing our data protection compliance as well and building it into our everyday processes. So I think, again, that's a particularly key way uh, to think about uh, building into data protection into your organisation by design. So um, I've talked a lot about there in relation to data protection privacy notices. And I think when you're looking at data protection with respect to your employees going forward from the 25th of May onwards, this is the main document that, or documents that you need to be thinking about and implementing as an employer. And I think this also implies in relation to data that you collect about your clients and things like that. So it may well be that you want to have a privacy notice up on your website, especially if you're collecting personal data for, from customers through web sales and things like that, or dealing with them remotely, taking orders over telephone, then having a privacy notice in relation to that as well. But in relation to employees, I would suggest that this is a document, firstly, a general privacy notice which would form part of your employee handbook. And what a privacy notice, what a privacy notice needs to do is certain things. So first of all, it needs to identify what personal data is 
been collected. So we are collecting this personal data. We're collecting your name, your address, your bank account details, health information, information relating to what equality and diversity. So first of all, it identifies what that data is. The second thing that privacy notice needs to identify is why you want or need that information. So we need this information because we're under a contractual obligation to make payment to you. So we need your bank account information. We need your health information because we're subject to certain health and safety obligations and we need to assess your capacity to carry out the work safely or in order to be able to apply first aid if you have a particular health condition. Um, you need to ex be explaining at some point how long you will keep that data for. Now you may then refer to a separate data retention schedule for employees which will then list that. Um, but certainly for clients, you'll be saying well, we will keep all of your personal data for the duration of the contract between us and then for a period of six years afterwards in case there's any sort of breach of contract claim was brought. Um, that privacy notice then needs to go on to explain uh, that an individual can ask for copies of their personal data and how to do that. Now generally that should be fairly obvious in the employment situation that they'll go to an office manager or an HR manager or a senior member of staff. But when we're talking about clients, then you should generally be supplying them with something like an email address or a contact address where they can write and say, please can you provide me with copies about the um, uh, data that you hold on file about me. You need to make them aware of that right through your privacy notice. Um, and then you also need to state further information about what their rights are. So you have the right to ask the data to be deleted. But you should probably go on to say then that we can refuse in certain circumstances. Uh, you should also state about the right to object to data being processed, but also again the right of the employer to say, well no, you can't object in these circumstances because otherwise we can't comply with our legal obligations or whatever. So it's my view that you should have a general data protection privacy notice in your staff handbook in relation to employees. What you would probably then also do is have a shorter notice at the point that you're collecting that personal data. So on your new starter form you'll have a paragraph at the top about data protection. We need this information in order to be able to manage you as an employee. Or on a health questionnaire, we need this information in order to assess your ability to come back to work after a period of absence be able to carry out your role because it's a regulated industry or we need to carry out a DBS check because you're going to be working with children or vulnerable adults. Um, so explaining at that point of collection the particular reason why you're collecting that personal data and what you're going to do with it and then you may then align at the end say for more information about your rights in relation to personal data as an employee please refer to our general data protection privacy notice which can be found within the staff handbook. So I think um, in, in relation to dealing with personal data as an employer, there should be two things that you're looking at first. What is what personal data have we currently got? Do we need it all? Do we need to get rid of some of it because it's out of date? Do we need to get some of it brought up to date? So that'll be the first step. And then the second step is, have we got adequate protection privacy notices in place? Uh, and if not, then I think that we need to look at getting those in place and issuing them to your employees. Uh, potentially also then you'll be looking at updating your employment contracts to issue to new contracts. So I'm not saying that you need to re reissue all your employment contracts, which may say at the moment just that you consent to us holding personal data. And I think that going forward your employment contracts need to be updated. Um, and that for existing staff, you would generally then issue a memo about the fact that the law is changing with a copy of your new general data privacy notice about what their rights are in relation to data protection and what you're going to do with their data, etc, etc. So I think that's a particularly key, two key steps that need to be looked at for all employers, but also in relation to all other personal data that you hold in relation to clients and things like that, suppliers, etc. Um, 
So I'm just now going to talk just a little bit briefly about what we're doing for our clients because I'm aware that we've got a number of existing clients who are present today and who will likely to have questions about what EL Direct are doing for our clients. So I'm going to talk about that briefly. I think now will be an appropriate time if anyone's got any specific questions that they want to ask at this stage, if you could put those up on the chat in the next minute or two then I'll endeavour to ask them uh, once I've completed the next section. So what are we doing for ER Direct clients? Well firstly, we've updated our employment contract wording. So for all contracts going forward, the data protection section doesn't refer to a consent. Instead it refers to the fact that the company has contractual and legal obligations to collect personal data. So now our employment contracts going forward will be updated. Now we've produced a GDPR compliant data protection policy which is now available to all EL Direct First for Employment clients within the First for Employment Staff Handbook. Um, so that um, uh, those can be issued to staff. We've also produced um, a general employee data protection privacy notice. Again, that's in the Staff Handbook section that can be um, provided uh, to all employees on or before the 25th of May so that you don't need to issue them with brand new employment contracts because you're covering it off with a separate document and that will be able to be signed off by employees through the first employment system. Um, we're also updating things like the new starter forms that we issue to clients, medical questionnaires etc. We've updated privacy notices to comply with the GDPR. Um, EL Direct is a data processor in relation to our clients because we hold and process personal data on behalf of our clients. And so therefore, uh, we've developed our own internal audited process whereby clients who will have decided, yes, that we now need to get rid of that information because it's out of date, we no longer need it, they can then inform us of that and we will deal with that through an auditable process so that we can then uh, have a record of that so that clients can show that yes they have de deleted personal data when that was done and why. So again we're helping clients as a data processor. Uh, and then finally we're developing our software to uh, enable clients to comply with GDPR more easily. And in particular we're looking at increasing the functionality of the employee portal that we offer in the first employment system which can currently be used to book holidays, uh, manage absence records and e-learning. In that individuals will be able to go in there and in time will be able to access copies of contracts and handbook policies, uh, letters that have been issued to them. So if they make a subject access request, then they can easily access that information. It's then not necessary for the office manager or HR manager to, um, to go and get a copy of the personal file and photocopy and scan it and send it to the individual because they'll have access to it online. And it'll also be easier for individuals to keep their information up to date. So in time we'll make it possible for individuals to go on there and update their address and update their bank details and then the employer will be automatically notified so it's a lot easier for employers to comply with their data protection obligations in relation to accuracy. So that's just a little bit uh, about what we're doing for clients and hopefully then clients can feel a bit more confident if the people who aren't clients have got an idea of the sort of things we're implementing on that basis. <coughs> um, uh, so now's the time I'll, I'll try to deal with, with any questions that anybody happens to have. So if you do, then, then please do ask those in the next minute or so. Uh, so I've seen that one particular uh, uh, viewer has asked a question about privacy notice on our emails, as we only take personal data from clients when they contact us, and what happens when they ring us. Uh, well, yes, I would suggest that it's uh, a good policy to have some sort of data privacy notice on your uh, email signature which you send out to clients and that might say that you know we will use the data that we've collected from you in order to provide the services um, that you requested uh, from us so for example in order to be able to, de de to deliver goods and products etc um, so yeah that's good practice and then you then may refer them through that email for to a more detailed privacy notice which you could publish on your website about that which might then go into a bit more information about if we've collected information from you for marketing purposes 
uh, you know, a venue can write to us at this address to say we no longer want to uh, uh, receive marketing materials from you. And as always, it's a good idea if you're sending marketing materials via email to have some sort of unsubscribe option on there, even if you're only sending that to corporate clients. Because uh, it's a common question, what do we do about our databases in relation to corporate clients? Well, we've got an individual member of staff's email address and we will send promotional information to them. Well, the view of the uh, ICO in relation to data protection and um, electronic communications is that if you're communicating to a corporate client, so this isn't to a consumer client, then you don't need to have uh, what they call a hard opt-in. So you don't need to have had that individual tick in a box saying, I consent to you sending us marketing information. Now, if you're dealing with consumer clients, members of the public who are acting in the course of business, then yes, you should be requiring them to tick a box to say that they agree to receiving that sort of information. But with, in the corporate um, environment, you can have what's called a soft opt-in, which means that you can effectively say to them, uh, if you provide us with an email address and we've made you aware that we've made some marketing materials to us, you need to inform us if you don't want us to, either by unsubscribing or sending us an email and things like that. Um, now the second part of that question is what happens when someone rings and they're handing over personal information? Well, this is why often a lot of organisations will um, maintain uh, records of calls for training and quality purposes as you'll have often have heard. Now what that means is they're not keeping records of all calls, but if they're collecting personal information, they sh you should really be requiring your operatives to, to read out some sort of privacy notice over a phone. So please can you give me, a, you know, I will need your name, address, telephone number and card details. And I'm just going to say shortly that we will need this information in order that we can process your payment um, and supply our services to you. Um, so uh, it's useful to do that. Now obviously it's difficult to evidence, which is why potentially you would then uh, keep a record of some phone calls as evidence of that. Or alternatively, as you said, Claire, have your privacy notice on your employees. So once that phone call's ended, you can send them an email to confirm the order and there'll be a bit of information about what you're going to do with their personal data at the bottom of that as well. And again, whether or not you're going to intend to use it for any other purposes, such as marketing, etc. So I hope that's answered that question for you. Um, so does anybody else who's uh, viewing have any further questions? Um, if you could please put those up on the chat in the next minute or so, uh, then I will try to uh, answer those. Um, if I don't receive any further questions, uh, then that concludes um, the presentation for today. Uh, we will be making a recording of today's webinar available on our YouTube channel, so you will be able to come back to it. And we will also provide to all people who register for today's webinar with a copy of the slides so they've got those um, available and also some suggested audit questions in relation to GDPR so you can do an initial check on how uh, prepared you are for GDPR in relation to employee data. Um, but otherwise, um, I'll uh, hang around for a couple of minutes to see if there's any more questions, but otherwise, thank you very much for your time. Uh, yeah, so I've had a question about from Richard again in relation to uh, dealing with, with people through their work emails. So yes, my view is, and I think this is confirmed by information on the Information Commissioner's website as well, is that if you have an individual's work email address on your database, so that's a work email, not a personal email, then you can send marketing information to them unless they opt out. So yes, they don't need to have actually said, 
I agree to receive your marketing email, so having a hard opt-in, you can send marketing information to them up until the point that they say, I no longer wish to receive marketing information from you. What you should do is give them an accessible way of opting out effectively. Um, so, uh, yes, I think the answer to that question is, is uh, uh, yes, Richard. Um, so I've got a um, couple of questions here. I think I'll deal with Les's first because it relates to both Claire and Richard's email. Uh, so yes, I would say that applies to prospective clients. Again, if it's a work email address and you collected that through some sort of corporate process, you might have met them at a networking event or you've obtained their email because it's published on LinkedIn or through a LinkedIn connection or something like that. They don't have to be an active client of yours to be able to send marketing material. If they're using a work email address, I would say yes, you can still send them marketing information until they actively opt out. Um, and then in relation to the question from uh, Bally, um, so can employees share email accounts if one is away on annual leave? Um, if it's an email address which has got the individual's name as part of it. So, for example, my email address is guy at erdirect.co.uk. Uh, I would suggest in those circumstances, individuals shouldn't be sharing email accounts because otherwise it's open to the individual who hasn't got that name to use that email account and to abuse it. And potentially then they could disclose personal information through that way and then say that it wasn't them. So I think that would be open to abuse. So my view is that if individuals have named email accounts and are aware on your leave, you should be using an out of office system as opposed to giving other people access to that email account. Also, by giving other people access to that email account, they could then potentially search through that and obtain personal information that they shouldn't have access to because you wouldn't be aware what information has been sent and received historically through that email account. I think if the email account doesn't identify a name, so obviously if someone uses an email account which is sales at or information at or accounts at, then yes, that's acceptable. And what you should say is that the individuals using that email account shouldn't be you know, sending information through that or engaging in email conversations which isn't relevant to the purpose that account was set up for. And that will mean that you may need to have individual email addresses um, and then uh, kind of department or role specific email addresses uh, which are used in different ways. So that would be my view in relation to that question.
Well, as that appears to be uh, the uh, end of the questions, I'm going to bring the webinar to a close now. Uh, so once again, thank you very much for your time um, and we'll uh, notify everybody as to where they can access the recording, a copy of the slides and the audit questions. Uh, and once again, thank you very much.